Good morning, everybody. This is The Secret Life of Medical Device Development. I'm Mike Heald, and uh, uh, Carl's already stolen my thunder slightly here. Principal consultant at Kamala Limited. I'm trained as a mechanic, uh, medical engineer, and I've spent the last 15 years developing medical devices, both pure mechanical and smart electromechanical, for the, uh, mainly for the pharmaceutical drug industry. Today, I'm going to try and take you on a holistic walk through the act of developing a medical device. Joining the dots um, without picking on a discrete activity. There's a lot of common sense that goes, that uh, is, underpins the regulation, but it seems lost both in presentation and often in interpretation. Development is still a complicated business, but stopping, taking a step back and asking why are we doing this can help you to see the woods despite those regulatory trees. So this morning, I'm going to introduce a fictitious new product vision. Now I'm going to talk about the approach, the common sense approach to designing that fictitious medical device, then go through proving that it does what you claim it does. And then lastly, I'm going to touch on what I'm calling the two ages of R&D, and you'll see what I mean when I get there. Our medical device vision could be anything. The FDA has classified approximately 1,700 different medical device types. And one of the reasons that regulations are kind of woolly is because they're trying to cover the width and breadth of that entire cosmos of medical devices, from wheelchairs to hearing aids to artificial hearts to drug delivery devices. But pretty soon, the question is asked, how long is it going to take and how much will it cost? Well, there's no straightforward answer to that. But when people ask me, I kick off with an assumption that it's going to take at least three years, which is um, often a bit of a shock to people. And we're talking a fairly simple mechanical device here with a few moving parts. If you want to add electronics and software, that drags in uh, a bunch of new standards and regulations, and it can really escalate the amount of effort that you need to put into the development and the cost of that development. Then there's a regulatory angle. You've got to be prepared to provide evidence that you've done the job properly. And we're talking document and documentation here, lots and lots of documentation. You've got to provide evidence of your planning. You've got to provide evidence of the execution of those plans, the actual development process itself. You've got to, pro you've got to provide documentation detailing the reasons why you've done what you've done and the decisions you've made. You've got to be able to show that the product is safe and effective. And you've got to be able to show that you have reviewed the development process periodically all the way through to make sure that it stayed on course for where it's supposed to be going. So let's dive into that common sense design process that I talked about earlier. I'm assuming that the, intent, the intention is to do the job properly. It's going to be planned, careful, methodical and structured. You'll also find that different organisations have their own names for the same things. Um, the name, naming conventions I'm using here are ones that I use and they're roughly aligned with the standards and regulations, but everyone's got their different take on it. It doesn't really matter as long as the information's there. We're going to start with planning our development. Who would set off on a journey without knowing where they're going, how or why, except maybe a backpacker? So we're going to look at the scope of the development. Just what is the development all about? What needs to be done? Who's going to do it? How are they going to do it? What information do they need? And how much risk is too much? And when you've asked these questions for the different parts of the development, you should have the basis of your planning, planning for the design and development, planning for your clinical evaluation. 
software development if you're using software, um, usability uh, interface, uh, user interface evaluation, and of course, risk management. Got to have a plan for that. And I'm going to talk a bit more about risk management now. Is the cure worse than the disease? So this little cartoon on the screen at the moment uh, shows a hydrotherapy pump. And the idea was they could use it to cure arthritis. They would bind the patient tightly and then use that pump to, to pump pressurized water into the mouth of the patient. The theory being that they would push the arthritis from the body. Well, we live in more enlightened times now and I think we all know that the benefit from this, uh, this device and this treatment is zero, while the risks are really quite considerable. And quite obviously, those risks outweigh the benefit of the, uh, the intended use of this device. This is why we have risk management. We don't want this sort of thing getting finding its way onto the market. So for our product, we've got to work out how much risk is too much risk. And it's different for every device. And here's why. You can see two different medical devices on the screen here. On the right, we have a defibrillator. The defibrillator is used to restart somebody's heart when they're on the brink of death. So the benefit from that is very, very high. If the patient receives some burns as a result of the use of the defibrillator, the patient, we like to think, is going to accept those burns as a small price to pay for having their life saved. So those burns are an acceptable risk for a defibrillator. If, on the other hand, the thermometer on the left burned the patient every time it was used, the, the, uh, the amount of benefit that that thermometer brings to the patient does not make a burn worthwhile. So the burn in this case is an unacceptable risk. And they're kind of two ends of the spectrum. And, and it, it shows why you need to decide how much risk is too much risk on a device by device basis. We're still planning here and we've got to declare how much risk is too much risk for our device. And we use a matrix a bit like this, and it has the components of risk on the axes. On the vertical axis on the left there, we see the probability of occurrence of harm. And across the top, we see severity of harm. Every cell inside that matrix represents a level of risk, the green ones, are thought to be acceptable and the red ones unacceptable. Up at the top left, we have negligible severity of harm and improbable occurrence of harm. That's about as safe as you can get. Uh, at the opposite end of the spectrum, the bottom right, is a catastrophic severity of harm, usually involving death and a frequent occurrence of that harm. So if your medical device is operating down in the bottom right there, you've got real problems. So we're in between those two extremes. There's a transition from acceptable to unacceptable. And you can see it there shown by the yellow line. Now, where that yellow line lands depends on your device and its benefits. If we're talking a defibrillator, then the benefits are very high, and that means they can offset more risk. So the green area would grow and the red area shrink, pushing that yellow line um, down and to the right. Conversely, the thermometer has got a much, much lower level of benefit, and that will offset less risk. So your green area would shrink and the red area would grow, pushing that line to the left and up. The trick is in setting that threshold. And to do that, we look at um, other products that are on the market that do something similar to yours. And we say, well, how much risk do they represent to the user? They're on the market, people are using it. Presumably, that is an acceptable level of risk. 
We can also turn to standards and regulation that helps to define a level of acceptable risk. And we can talk to healthcare professionals and would-be users of our product to see what they consider to be an acceptable level of risk for the benefit that your product promises to provide. By way of an example, in the past, um, when working on uh, injection devices, I've used legislation to help me with this. In fact, um, the anti-needle stick legislation um, mandates that healthcare professionals use a needle safety device to prevent accidental needle sticks, um, to try and prevent them from contracting diseases and, and specifically uh, life-changing diseases like hepatitis and HIV. Before the, the legislation was introduced, approximately one in 20 million injections resulted in a healthcare professional contracting such a life-changing disease. And around the globe, hundreds and hundreds of healthcare professionals every year would fall victim to one of these very unpleasant diseases. But what we've got there are the components of risk. We've got a severity, the life-changing disease, and we've got an occurrence of that harm, which is the one in 20 million injections. And we know that's unacceptable. That's an unacceptable risk because the legislation was introduced to address it. So that can help me to start building a rationale for where I put that threshold in my risk acceptability matrix. All this information and reasoning needs to go into the risk management plan. So I'm done with planning. You'll have to excuse my artist's sense of humor here, but it's time to get on with development. But don't get your spanners out yet though. We've still got some more documentation to do. We've got to state the purpose of our device. What's it for? Who's going to use it? Where and when are they going to use it? What should it do? And how much of that thing should it do? What marketing claims you want to make, like this lovely, uh, lovely product that we've seen advertisement for on the screen? Does it interface with another medical device? All these things constitute a series of claims, generally referred to as the intended use and use specification. The regulators will judge the product against these claims. However, we can't design against the intended use. We need a lot more detail. So we're gonna break it down in two further stages. First stop is user level. We're gonna expand each one of those use claims into a set of traceable user needs. The idea being that everything that we're claiming about the device is what the users need from it, nothing more, nothing less. So we need every single one of those claims to be represented by a user need. And it needs to be traceable. If you've got a user need, that doesn't have a corresponding intended use claim, it means very likely your product will do something you're not claiming. And the reverse is true as well. If you've got a, an intended use claim that doesn't have a corresponding user need, the likelihood is your product will not do everything that you're claiming. This is the first half of your design inputs. Now we move down a level into the end, what I'm calling the engineering level. And what we have to do here is translate those user needs into design input requirements for your design brief. And it needs to be traceable. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the design input requirements our design objectives and constraints for the design team to hit. And we're talking numbers here, forces, volumes, rates, dimensions, temperatures, times, voltages, counts. They need to be function-based and solution-neutral. 
So don't be tempted to specify a widget because you think that's the best way of achieving certain functionality. What you need to specify is the functionality you want to achieve and let the design team and the design process decide whether a widget is the best way of achieving that, or in fact, if there's a better way of doing it. But you need 100% traceability between user needs and, and your design input requirements. Again, you shouldn't have a user need that doesn't have corresponding design input requirements and vice versa. This is the second half of our design inputs, and it should include the user interface specification for usability engineering. All right, so now the magic happens. You can unshackle your engineers, scientists, and designers and let them get busy. It's where the values added, the creative act of problem solving and designing. It's what everyone's been looking forward to. Here, we're going to start off with a principle on which our medical device depends for its function and try and prove that you can make it work as a principle. And when you can, you then wrap that principle in a concept and prove that the principle still functions when it's packaged as a product. When you've got that working, you go on to design for robustness and reliability. Make sure that when it's out there in the field, it can cope with everything life throws at it and still work properly. You wanna make it look good with some industrial design. You wanna make sure that it can be manufactured and maintained or serviced uh, easily and at a reasonable cost. And of course, you've gotta make sure that people you can use it safely and effectively. And as I mentioned before, periodically, as you're doing all this, you're gonna be reviewing progress and you've got to keep it safe. The act of the creative act of development generates a lot of design output as the evidence of that process. You've got your documented design reviews, and also this is where you design your interface, your user interface for usability engineering. But coming back to keeping it safe, I'm talking about risk management again. So we've got our product and we need to know what are the risks. So what's on the screen at the moment, many of you might recognize, as a, a failure modes and effects analysis, FMEA table. This is bottom-up analysis. So you start with the detail and say, how can that go wrong? And then look at how that failure at detail level will manifest itself at system level. And once you know that, you can work out how that system level failure will harm somebody and how often it will harm somebody. And then you've got the two components of risk that you need to look up on your risk acceptability table and see if that risk is acceptable or unacceptable. Spreadsheets are very popular. They're very simple, really. You can do them in an Excel spreadsheet, but they are very time consuming because you have to work through all the detail. And just one FMEA can easily rack up a thousand lines and you're going to have several FMEA in your project. They're also a little bit limited because they can only give you one failure mode at a time. However, we can also do top-down analysis, and you can see an example of fault tree analysis here. For top-down analysis, you start with the um, hazardous situation and harm that you would like to avoid. And you work your way down through the product system and subsystems until you can identify the root cause at the detail level. Fault tree analysis is quite tricky to do, and it's quite tricky, tricky to, to, uh, to record and document. It takes quite a, quite a bit of practice and skill, but it's much quicker than FMEA when it comes to exposing the really juicy risks in your device. 
It's also advantageous because it can expose compound failure modes where you've got more than one failure happening at a time to contribute to that top level hazardous uh, situation and harm. And it can also tell you when those compound failure modes come from two different, two different uh, um, processes such as design or use or from manufacture. Of course, for maximum coverage and the best results, we need to do both bottom up and top down. But yes, it does take a long time. But once we've done this, we've got our risk assessments and our risk evaluations. It's also given us our hazard related use scenarios. It's helped us to understand what our software safety classification is, if we've got software. It's showing us where our biocompatibility risks are. So a lot of information comes out of risk management. In fact, there's some more. We can look at our risk management and our risk analyses and say, what elements of the product can do the most harm if they failed? We want to take extra care over the testing and production of those safety critical elements. These are your essential design outputs. And if you've got electronics, they're essential performance powered by risk management. And while we're at it, let's see if people can use it properly. We've done use risk analysis, where a team of people have sat, have sat down and tried to anticipate how users will get it wrong. But the design team are blinkered and uh, users might see the device in a very different way. And there is one example of this that stuck with me um, from a product I was working on some time ago. And it looked like, the, uh, looked like the device that you see on the screen. The user had to follow instructions on, this, on the device screen. And to use it, they had to hold the base of the handle against their skin. And the design team had developed this product from a blank sheet of paper. And um, for them, form followed function, and it seemed perfectly simple, perfectly obvious. But we took it and gave it to some people who had never seen it before, and these are intelligent, well-educated people. Gave them the instructions for use and asked them to give it a go. And it all went very smoothly until it came to applying the device to the skin. And people started turning it around and using it upside down. And we could not understand why. We interviewed them afterwards and said, look, you were using it upside down. Do you, do you know why? And what we discovered is that when they saw the device, what they saw was a scan and go barcode reader like the one they use at the supermarkets. And of course, the scanning part of the barcode reader is in the head. You hold the head against the, uh, the tin of beans or whatever you want to buy to get the reading. And that cognitive association was so strong between the scan and go device and our medical device that it overrode what was in the instructions for use and um, what was on the screen. So when they were using it upside down, it, it, the, the fact that this, the text and the images on the screen were also upside down didn't stop them. So that was a real eye opener for me and showed me the value of formative evaluations. Now, hopefully, we know what all the risks are with the device. And it's time to set about fixing them. And there is a hierarchy to how we should go about doing this. So the first option and the very best option is to redesign to completely remove the hazard or put it so far into the green that, it's a, that it is negligible. Sometimes we can't do that. So what we have to do is resort to a design change 
that changes the outcome of the hazard should it, uh, should it actually happen. So say for instance, um, we, we can't rule out our device overheating in a single fault condition. We can add a safety, a thermal cutout which will change the outcome from maybe a burn injury to simply the device shutting down and the therapy not being delivered. And hopefully that will be a preferable outcome. The third and worst option is to add a warning into the instructions for use. Um, or on putting something on the box or the device label. This is rubbish because apart from perhaps device designers, barely anybody reads the instructions for use or what's written on the box, especially the warnings. For certain risks, we can turn to harmonized or recognized standards that give us ways of controlling those risks that the regulators are familiar with and comfortable with, and it gives them a warm and fuzzy feeling when they see it. As we're doing this, we are introducing risk control measures. And those risk control measures really need turning into design input requirements and tracing. This really improves the chances of those risk control measures actually being implemented in the device and not just staying as a nice idea on a sheet of paper. Now we've got a design. The risks are fixed, but does it measure up to those claims we want to make? We move into the test phase and we stay down at the engineering level and we take the, take the device into the lab and we test it against all those numbers we put in the design brief. And we want 100% coverage and traceability, so we need, we need a check or a test for every single one of those design input requirements that we've got. And we can subject it to measuring and various tests and inspections and analysis. And hopefully when you've done that, you've proven that the product you've got is everything that you require in that design brief. And this is design verification. We've still got some more work to do though because success lies in how well you translated those user needs into the design brief. And this is where problems can occur, a poor translation or inaccurate. So we move up to the user level again, and we give the final product to would-be users of the device and see if it really does meet their needs. And we need to confirm that every user need was properly translated into the design brief. Confirm that the product does actually live up to the claims we make in the intended use. And this is where we do our design validation and our clinical evaluation and summative evaluation. It all goes on here. Now, you might think it's time to celebrate. We've, uh, we've proved that we have actually developed what we set out to develop, but there's still a little job that needs doing. Are the risks really fixed? Yeah, we, we're back in risk management again. First of all, have all the risk control measures actually been implemented? So you can now look at your design output and your verification testing. And you should be able to confirm that yes, all the risk control measures have been implemented. And that's why we had traceability between the risk control measures and design inputs so that we can follow them all the way back. You should also, now that you've done your verification and validation testing, you should also have an indication of how well those risk control measures actually work. Only now do you have the evidence that you need to determine if the remaining, if those residual risks are acceptable or unacceptable. 
This is your risk control verification and your residual risk evaluation. We're nearly there. We've got one more question to ask. Do we have a safe device? This is the million dollar question, quite literally in many cases. The ultimate test of your development. You consider all the risks at once and determine whether they're sufficiently offset by the device benefits. Is your cure preferable to the disease it's trying to treat? Hopefully the answer is yes, and you can take your device to the market. You've done your evaluation of overall residual risk. You've done your benefit risk analysis, and you've written your final risk management report to say yes, all the evidence indicates that this device is indeed safe. Congratulations. Now I mentioned at the top, the two ages of um, R&D. We've looked at the process of development in a monolithic sense, but there's good reason to split it in two. And the two parts are research and development. Research is where you're starting with a blank sheet of paper and you're trying out ideas and combining ideas and splitting them and trying something new. Quick and dirty, failing fast, but you're aiming to prove your principle and prove the concept before you go into the development phase. You want to be able to peer down the development tunnel and see if there's light at the end. Then when you're confident that your principle and your concept are proven well enough, you can transition into development. Development is buttoned down, it's careful, controlled and documented. documented. This is where you perfect your concept. You do your design for robustness, design for manufacture, design for maintenance and servicing. Development is done under change control. So every change you want to make to the design requires you to go through a process of checks and balances. If you move into development, too early and you're still really in research phase you still you've got too many gross changes to make to the to the uh, to the design and you get bogged down in change control and it can strangle the process if you move into development too late and the design is effectively a fait accompli you can't provide a design history file because there is very little history to the development of the device. So you need to choose your moment carefully when you make that transition from research to development. And the moment at which you do transition is usually signaled by approval of the design and development plan. That's when the plan is, uh, is effective and you're going into design controls. But sticking with research, it is much more than just making an idea work. You're going to prepare all your plans and the design inputs in draft. You're going to do your literature research and state of the art for clinical evaluation. Having developed your, your uh, novel solutions, you want to be able to protect your own intellectual property, as well as making sure that you don't risk infringing somebody else's. You want to marry your device and target markets to a regulatory strategy. Set up and calibrate your risk management process, and we saw a little bit of what was involved earlier. You can anticipate the scale and cost of verification and validation testing. You can project forwards and see what equipment you're going to need, how much resource, how long it's going to take. So consider, for instance, a product that takes half an hour to do its thing. If its design life is 2,000 cycles, you're looking at in excess of four months testing 
to make sure that you can test that design life. Run some formative usability and market preference testing and make sure that it's not going to come a cropper when you put it in people's hands. And you can make it look good. Doing all this lays the foundations for your development process and saves a lot of work when you actually get there. So the time has come for me to wrap up and just quickly go back over what we've covered. I've talked about the scale of development in terms of effort and cost and the effect of adding um, electronics and software to the product. Um, uh, the next speaker may have something to say about this as well. I hope he agrees. And um, <clears throat> that, that starting point of three years is, has proven to be quite reliable for me over the years. The best way of minimizing time to market is through efficiency, making your development processes as efficient as possible. I've talked about the two ages of R&D, getting things roughed out in the research phase and then moving into development where it's all very controlled and documented and choosing that moment of transition very carefully. The uh, design controls process is really geared towards making sure that you actually develop what you set out to develop. And that's why we kick off with those intended use claims that that stake your claim in terms of what the device is going to do and who for and how. And then you go through this, uh, this process of breaking it down, maintaining traceability, and then testing back up again, maintaining traceability all the time to make sure that you land exactly where you said you would. And making sure that we actually develop what we intended uh, <clears throat> and we can take it to market. Finally, there's risk management, and you can see how I've been dipping in and out of risk management all the way through. It is tremendously important to a uh, device development process. Um, and uh, for me, I think it is up, underrepresented in the FDA's uh, uh, quality systems regulation, but is absolutely essential. You've got to make sure that the device has more benefit than risk. You need to be absolutely sure of it and be ready to prove it. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I've hoped you've all enjoyed it as well as um, gaining something from it that you can use in your jobs.